I sure appreciate the video and the work that went into that, but also the thought behind the video. I'd like to ask you something tonight. If you turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter number 4, I'm going to tell you now what I'm going to ask at invitation time. I'm going to ask you to commit to pray this month about where you ought to serve. I'm going to ask you to pray about that and then ask you if you'll be willing to respond whenever God speaks to you about that. That's where I'm going with the sermon. Just so you know, I figured I'd tell you first, so if you don't want to listen to that, you might as well get up and walk out, and that's all right. And um, I tell you what, I, I love being at First Baptist Church, and I love the ministries that God has allowed us to have here at First Baptist Church. Remember when we, had, uh, when we didn't have a Reformers Unanimous, and now we do have Reformers Unanimous. There's a lot of addictions ministries out there. Right, gentlemen, ladies, a lot of them out there. Not many are faith-based. Because of that, not many are long-term successful. There are some successes along the way, um, but not long-term successful like, or successes like we've seen in Reformers Unanimous, TGGW, our, our housing ministry. I remember when, uh, when our, as a church family, it was a, kind of an awkward transition because some people initially came to church that weren't perfect. Can you believe that? Imperfect people in this, this, this very auditorium, First Baptist Church. I remember some of the pharisaical, sanctimonious comments that were made. There's a few things that will fire me up in life. Mishandling God's Word. Being rude to my wife. That'll do it. I guess my mother's in there too. Someone once said, I overheard them in passing as they were moving their seat in the auditorium. This is, the day, this is in the days before I asked you to move around. They actually moved because they said, I don't want to sit by, quote, those people. Hmm. It probably would not surprise you that that particular person is no longer in church. I don't say that gladly or, or with any uh, uh, bitterness or malice. It's just as fact. But I doubt you would be surprised by that last statement, though you would be surprised by the first statement. But this is what a church is about, is it not? To embrace everyone who comes because we're all imperfect. We all need the, need the touch of Jesus on our life, all right, because he can transform us, he can change us, he can make us something new again. Jeremiah chapter 18. Many opportunities to serve in our you, but all over this church. Nehemiah chapter 4, a great, uh, a great book in the Bible about the rebuilding of the walls. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we have a little problem, though. Boy, in Nehemiah chapter 1, he gets fired up, touched by God, a little scared of the king, and so he prays, but the king gives him, the uh, Lord gives him grace in the king's sight and in, his, in favor with him, and he's sent back to Jerusalem, and now Nehemiah is tasked with rebuilding the walls. He's been given some funds and some help. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 1, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of the Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. And he said... Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Now, Tobiah joined into the fray, to the ruckus, with a little sarcastic, demeaning jab. Even a little fox will knock down what you're doing. Now, there's no way that what you're doing will survive any kind of pressure. You have folks in Reformers Unanimous, faith-based, there's no way that can withstand a real pressure in life. <laughs> How wrong people are. Verse number four, hear, O God, our, uh, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and to cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind, what's the last two words? To work. For the people had a mind to work. You know what I'm going to challenge us in the month of March at First Baptist Church in 2020? 
I would pray that we'd have, like the children of Israel here in Jerusalem, that we would have a mind to work, to work. Not for our own benefit, not for our own glory, but for His benefit, for we believe God. There are some that will say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm, I'm tired sometimes. You know that work makes you tired sometimes? You ever tired from the way home from work? I've heard this, though I'm not yet. I've heard that being retired also makes you tired. Anybody heard that? I found that vacation makes me tired. Come on, I come back from vacation, and I need a vacation from my vacation. Am I the only one? No. So what that tells me is I'm always going to be tired. <laughs> And I can use it as an excuse or just deal with reality. I remember we had a neighbor, Pop Pop was his name, a good man and his wife, and, and uh, he was retired. I'd ask him each day, you know, often when I saw him when I come home, how you doing, Pop Pop? How was today? He said, every day is a holiday. A good outlook on life, is it not? Every day is a holiday when we serve the Lord. I'm tired, Pastor Howell. I'm too old to serve. Look at all these young people. They got some, some young children sitting all up front, the old people sitting all in back. They can see me. They sit close. You can't see me, and you prefer it that way. You know better. Gladys, or Gladys Burrell ran a marathon at age 92. Tichi Igarashi climbed Mount Fuji at age 100. John Glenn went to space. How old? 77 years old went to space. The thesaurus was invented by Peter Rodgett at age 73. And Colonel Sanders started Kentucky Fried Chicken at age 65. So don't tell me you're too old to work at First Baptist Church. You're too old to serve God. Maybe you can't be a runner on the bus. I understand that. Not because you can't, but because by the time you get off the bus and back on the bus, we'll be at the next bus stop. That's all right. Your, your opportunities may change, but don't tell me that, that we're too old to serve God. Don't tell me you're too young to serve God. Well, Pastor, I'm only, I'm only three. I was uh, greeted at another church a few months back by a first grader at the door. He was part of the greeting team of that church. I like that. I'm going to challenge you young people. You can sign up for ministries too. Now, just because you sign up doesn't mean that you'll be in that ministry. I should give that disclaimer right now. <laughs> my wife right now, I want to preach. <laughs> so that's because you're saying, now, listen, I tell you what, if she, she's not going to preach, but if she were to preach, if we're that kind of church and we're not, you would not want to come that night. My <laughs> brother, how can she not speak? Oh, she can speak. All right, but she's going to say it like it is. I told Mrs. Chrissy for years, I knew she wrote the messages for her husband, like my wife writes, my, or at least the good ones. If you like it, my wife wrote it. Highlights the area, this is for you, Howell. You know, she... <laughs> But just because you sign up, but, but listen, we can't make excuses. I'm too tired. I'm too old. I don't have enough time. Really? It, are you short on time as opposed to someone else? Do you not get the same amount as, as someone else gets? Well, you see, Pastor, I have to work overtime. Many of us have long jobs. But I just uh, recently was at a church where the average commute to church, if it was short, was 30, 35 minutes. Some an hour, hour and a half, and the average commute to work was an hour and a half. Aren't you glad we live in Saginaw, Michigan? There are some that drive that kind of distance here, but they are few and far between. My wife's father, who worked in Newark, New Jersey for years, would leave at what, honey, 3.30 in the morning? Right about 3.30 in the morning so we could get there and miss the rush hour. That's crazy time. And I, last time I checked, we don't have any ministries that operate at 3.30 in the morning at First Baptist Church. We can't make excuses about time or tired or old. We need to have, like we see in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse number 6, a mind, help me, to work. Lord, help us tonight in this few moments to look at your word and to, Lord, would you touch us? May we see the application from your word and the help from your word. Lord, would your spirit accomplish something in our hearts tonight through your word? May we respond the way we ought to. In Jesus' name, I ask amen. I see three things that are strong in this passage. Whenever you have a mind to work or whenever you try to get something done, there's something that happens to us in the Lord's work. First of all, there's going to be, there is going to be strong opposition. 
There is going to be strong opposition. If you're, if you're working in any ministry at First Baptist Church, not every day, not every second, but there will be not just opposition, but sometimes strong opposition. Sometimes it'll come from inside. On a Sunday morning, when today you want to sleep in, today it's cold. Sometimes it comes from without. You know, we've been stopped now again, um, trying to stop us from soul winning the city of Saginaw. This is an exciting time at First Baptist Church. There may come a time when, I'm, when I say to the congregation, listen, we're all going over to this particular area. We're all going to go soul winning at the same time. It's our legal right to go soul winning. But we're going to face opposition. They say that if you put a bunch of crabs in a bucket, you'll witness something interesting. That when one crab attempts to climb out of a bucket, the other crabs will pull him back down to the, into the bucket. Now, I have never verified this. Any crabs that I buy have been previously steamed or are about to be steamed. If I find them on the beach, my wife has caught them. And uh, I'll tell you another time about the time she tried to feed the crab to the seagull for people to watch. Didn't work out so well. But apparently, the crabs don't want another crab to get ahead. So they pull it back down. This is what's happening in this passage, right? Sam Ballad and Tobiah, they can't stand the fact that someone could get ahead of the situation. They could rebuild the walls. And, and they didn't have a mind to work. And they didn't want anyone else to have a mind to work either. And there's going to be some opposition, sometimes from within the church that you're going to have a mind to work, a mind to serve, and someone else who maybe doesn't have that similar mind is going to try to oppose what you're doing. We have so many tremendous servants of the Lord here at First Baptist Church, so many faithful, committed servants, and there are so many thankless ministries here at First Baptist Church. And I say thankless because there's only thankless here on earth, because know that your labor is not in vain for Him, not for us. I think about our, our ladies in the nurseries and some gentlemen in the nurseries as well. That is a thankless job. I had small children, zero to three months, two and three. I noticed something about these little kids, especially, you know, James when he was a baby at two months. Very ungrateful baby. At two and three months, James never told me thank you. I should have disciplined him more about that, should I not have? And in fact, he was so ungrateful that, that after Doreen would feed him, a few hours later, he would act like she'd never fed him before. Of all the nerve, just talk about ungrateful children. Thankless ministry. I was able to work on a bus route for about 12 years here at First Baptist Church. What a tremendous time, my wife and, and some of you who were able to work with us, we just enjoyed that. And in fact, I think Zach and Hannah who worked with us, and sure enough, they started liking each other, get married, have a couple kids. John and, and Katie Clark, they worked with us, started liking each other, got married, have a couple kids. So what moral stories, if you work with us on the bus, you get married, have a couple kids, apparently. I don't know. But you're on the bus route. I don't know, Ben, you worked with us. Amanda didn't. You got married, had a couple kids. I tell you what, just having kids, I guess that's a... We're on a bus, and uh, those kids do not say thank you very often, do they? And sometimes, right, sometimes... We don't do it for that, but normally they're not jumping on the bus. Thank you for picking me up, boy. It's like, hey, where's my candy? I want the other candy. I don't want this candy. Right? A thankless ministry. We have a donut and coffee ministry Sunday mornings, do we not? Talk about a thankless ministry. Because some of you Christians don't have Jesus in your heart Sunday mornings when you get here at 945. So you head to that coffee station. And sometimes you have someone who even allows it to come out of their mouth, spew out a little bit. Hey, did you see the donuts, Pastor? Did you see these donuts? Did you see these donuts? Not too often do these men who come and serve early to get that ready for us, do we say, thank you for coming early. Th thank you for getting coffee out and, and having creamer. No, no, no. There's only four types of syrups. I wanted five. We're out of hazelnut. Hazelnut's gone. <laughs> Happens, doesn't it? Thankless. Thankless ministry. People that sing in the choir, play in the orchestra. How often have you, and don't answer that loud, orchestra and choir members been thanked for your ministry? A thankless ministry. But we don't serve for the thanks, but just understand we serve for Him. 
I'm so glad that even in the face of opposition, we can serve God. See, the, the opposition was strong. It was full of animosity, full of accusation, and full of abuse. Someone once said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Foolish phrase, is it not? I prefer this, perhaps, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words hurt forever. You can still remember things that people have said in opposition to you, can you not? I still remember in eighth grade, a, a young man, a fellow student who made fun of the pair of pants I had on. And it's interesting what stays in our mind, right? I'm sure there are plenty of times that we had no interaction, but I remember that day in eighth grade. Isn't that how our mind works, though? There's going to be opposition. If we choose to have a mind to work, to serve, there's going to be opposition. I can't help but think of David when he was about to face Goliath, and as he went around speaking of, of what was going on, he got opposition from his brother, Eliab. I know the naughtiness of thine heart. David, you're in this for yourself. Now, if you read closely in that passage, you'll find out that what really prompted David to go after Goliath at first was the prize. Read it later on. He says, what shall be done? Well, I get to marry that beautiful girl? Hmm? Face opposition. Theodore Roosevelt said, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how, strong, how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have been done better. But the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by the dust and sweat and blood, who strives and errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, who does actually try to do the deed, who knows the great, great enthusiasm, the great devotion, and spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while doing, daring greatly. Be prepared for opposition. But I also see quickly tonight, I see some strong faith. In verse number 4, we have another prayer from Nehemiah. There's some tremendous prayers in Nehemiah. I like the fact that often in Nehemiah, when you see a prayer, it goes right to prayer. It doesn't say, and Nehemiah prayed. You just know that it went from storytelling to prayer. And he just went to the one place that he could go, his God. And they didn't plan it this way, but this morning we spent a lot of time right on prayer in our life from the life of Daniel. I can't help but again point out the fact from tonight's passage that prayer was Nehemiah's first response. We often honor our first responders here at First Baptist Church, and I'm so glad we do. They serve in a thankless job often as police and firefighters and dispatch and EMTs and other people who serve in first responders. But I, but I would submit that our first, our first responder in our life ought to be prayer. Or if I say it this way, first responder is God. If we truly believe God, for I believe God, the first responder ought to be Him. I see that Nehemiah went right there strong in prayer. Strong in position. Boy, he prayed in that prayer some, some pretty harsh things. But he left it in God's hands. He said, God... In verse number 5, they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. He says, God, this is not about Sanballat and me. It's about you and these guys. Can I submit something to you? The next time you face some opposition, you submit it to prayer, give it to prayer. Give it all to God in prayer. Make your position all in prayer to God, not partially to God. All of it. Lord, it's, Lord, it's, it's your battle to fight. Lord, th this is really your problem because this person who's, who's opposing what I'm trying to do here is really opposing you and your work. Sometimes we, we want to take it personally. I can't believe they'd come against me. Don't they know how long I've been here at First Baptist Church? Who gives a rip? The battle is the Lord's. Ira Sankey was traveling on a steamer down the Delaware River when he was asked to sing a great hymn writer Ira Sankey was. He wrote and then sang this song that night, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. When he finished leading this song, a man stepped forth from the shadows and asked to Mr. Sankey, did you ever serve in the Union Army? Yes, Mr. Sankey replied, in the spring of 1860. 
The next question came just as quickly. Can you remember if you were doing picket duty on a bright moonlit night in 1862? Again, Ira Sankey responded, yes. The man told this story, so did I. But I was serving in the Confederate Army. When I saw you standing at your post, I thought to myself, that fellow will never get away alive. I raised my musket and took aim. I was standing in the shadow, completely concealed, while the full light of the moon was falling upon you. At that instant, just at that moment, you raised your eyes to heaven and began to sing that sang song that you sang just now. Let him sing his song to the end, I said to myself. I can shoot him afterwards. He's my victim at all events, and my bullet cannot miss him. But you sang that song, and I heard those words perfectly. We are thine. Do thou befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. The Confederate soldier said those words stirred up many memories. I began to think of my childhood and my God-fearing mother, who had many times sung that very same song to me. When he finished her song, it was impossible for me to take aim again. I thought, Lord, who is the Lord who is able to save that man from certain death must surely be great and mighty. And my arm of its, and my arm of its own accord dropped limp at my side. What can God do? He can work in mysterious ways. He can solve problems that we don't even know are there. They have a strong position in the Lord. And last, late at night, I see not only strong opposition and strong faith, but I see a strong response. I like verse number 6. You see, verse, verse, first few verses, they faced some opposition, and then there was a prayer, but verse number 6 said what they did. So built we the wall. Can you say that with me? So built we the wall. You know what they did after they faced the opposition, after they prayed? You know what they did? They built the wall. <laughs> they weren't immobilized. They weren't paralyzed. They built the wall. I see a, a few things here. They were strong in unity. Strong in unity. The Bible says, and the wall was joined together into the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. You know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks to us about unity in the church. And there are diversities. But it is the same God which worketh in all in all. In verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. You know that if we're going to accomplish all that we should at First Baptist Church, there needs to be a spirit, and I mean from the Holy Spirit, of holy unity. There's going to be different personalities. There's going to be people that maybe you click with better, connect with better, that when you make a joke, they actually laugh at it. We all have a courtesy laugh. Well, at least I think all of us do. Maybe some of you don't. Most everyone does. I remember it was early on, one of my children uh, came to my wife and said, you know, Mommy, one of my young sons, and he said, Mommy, when so-and-so said that joke, uh, it wasn't very funny, but I laughed. Was that wrong? And even at the age of four, he figured out a courtesy laugh. It's from his mother. It's not from me, I promise. Not from me. And sure, there's going to be some people that you think are funnier than others. Or you, you just work, I mean, just hand in hand with. But you know, because of the Holy Spirit, we can all be in unity. We can all be headed the same direction. I love the fact that because of Jesus Christ, I know different people. Because of Jesus Christ, I know you, you know me. Besides this church and Jesus Christ, how would we know each other? It would not bring us together. Some of you are from across the United States. How would I know you besides Jesus Christ? What a blessing. What a blessing. I remember years ago, I was at Menards. I thought about this, and I saw Brother Philhart when his wife was still living, and we stood there at Menards and talked for probably 15 minutes. A young man here at the staff on that time. They walked away, the Philharts, and I remember thinking, boy, apart from Jesus Christ, I wouldn't know the Philharts. I generally say hi to people when I'm out and about. That's kind of my personality. All right, I just wave and say hi. And why? I don't know. It's just what I do. But I don't typically stand and talk for 15 minutes to complete strangers. But those people weren't strangers. We had a unity because of the bond of Jesus Christ. There was a unity. The people had a mind to work. There was a unity. They were strong in work, and they were strong in vision. At the age of 25, Adoniram Judson was the first American missionary to Burma. 
He and Anne married two weeks before they boarded a ship bound for India, from which they eventually made their way to Burma. Judson would spend the next nearly 40 years of his life living among and witnessing to the Burmese people. Until her death, Anne was a friend of many and even more fluent in, Bur in the Burmese language than her academically inclined husband. Judson's efforts were slow going. He was imprisoned and tortured, and for years he had not one single convert. But he was strong in a vision. He never gave up on his God-given calling to reach Burma for Jesus Christ. Before his death, Adoniram Judson had not only established several churches in Burma, but he had also given Burma one of its greatest gifts, the Bible in their own language. You see, I imagine that we'd be strong in vision if we knew the end of the story. If God came to you and you're on the bus route and said, listen, go to this house and pick up this young man or this young lady because in 35 years, they're going to be a tremendous evangelist and see thousands saved for the cause of Christ. Would you labor? Would you be strong in labor if you knew that? Of course you would. I think you would. I think we'd be strong in labor if we had uh, uh, the vision that if God gave us the end of the story in the nursery. Listen, labor in the nursery. Understand that this young person, you're going to help. And because of your influence, they're going to reach this person and this person, Jesus Christ. They're going to accomplish these great things in life. So, so, so keep on laboring. Would you stay another week in the nursery? I think you would. I think you would. The problem is, God doesn't tell us all the rest of the story. He tells us some things. He says, your labor is not in vain and we'll get rewards for our labor. He just doesn't tell us exactly what those look like. Oh, but when you invest in a ministry, invest in people, and you see just some small, from God's perspective, things that we think are huge. This young person you invest in now goes on and, and wow, you see what they're doing. Thank you, Lord. See, strong in vision, the vision for what needs to be done and the vision for our Lord. It's ministry month at First Baptist Church. We are not a restaurant. At a restaurant, you go and get fed, get served, and you leave. Most times at restaurants, you don't have to wash the dishes in order to leave. Most times when you walk in, they don't hand you a vacuum cleaner and say, Sir, would you please vacuum the back of the restaurant for us? We could really use your help. Sir, the, the chef is out tonight. Could you, could you please could you make the green beans for us? Sir, our dishes are all dirty. Here's some soap and water and a, and a rag. Can you help us please wash some dishes? In fact, if that happened, he walked in Applebee's and they said, Can you wash the dishes? You probably would not stay. Well, I don't need to walk. Are you paying me anything? I didn't come out. I didn't come out to work. I came out to be served and be fed. Yeah, you know, sometimes people come to church with that same mentality. I didn't come to serve. I came to be served. I came to be fed. I came to sit and listen to God's word and, and hear the beautiful music of First Baptist Church. And no, no, no. I, I can't help wash the dishes. That's not why I'm here. We've missed what God has for us in a church. It's to serve. Serve Him through serving each other. Lord, I thank you for this passage this time tonight and for these wonderful people. Lord, you've truly done a great work here in Saginaw and are continuing to do a great work. I thank you for that. Lord, I pray and ask you to help us to examine our hearts tonight. I told you I was going to ask you to do a couple things. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but if I can, for a turned heart. Would you commit this month? Commit to take these papers and ask God how you can serve? Would you make that commitment? I do not ask that commitment lightly. I would not want you to make that commitment if you wouldn't do that. But it's not a hard commitment to pray and see God's face. It seems like a pretty easy commitment. A harder commitment that I should also pray about is this. 
Would you commit to following the Lord as he leads you? Sometimes fear will hold us back. Sometimes lack of understanding. Every time that we follow our flesh instead of follow in our faith, we miss out on blessing. In a few moments, I'll pray, the piano will play, we'll stand our feet, and the invitation will be open. If you're willing, like I mentioned at the beginning, I'd ask you to make that commitment. You come up here and pray, or as God leads you. But I'd love for our church, as a church, not as some few people here and few people here, but as a church, serve God as a church. Lord, I thank you for this time and for your word. Lord, may we search our hearts, may we respond to you. Lord, may we be willing to seek your face in this area of ministry, and then, Lord, give us the grace and the strength to obey you as you lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand to our feet, heads, out, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Front altars open. You come and pray if you need to. Would you make that commitment tonight? Thank you that you are willing to use our feeble efforts when with your power, infused with your power, you do great and mighty works. Lord, help us this month to really focus on how we can better serve you and serve you here at this church, Lord. Well, thank you for the folks who have made this commitment. I pray you'd help them to, to follow through on it. In your precious name, I am.